to today's seminar. This is the third of a series of 10 Connect and Learn webinars designed to support AOD clinicians throughout regional and metropolitan Victoria, the Department of Health and Human Services. My name is Sandra Rogue and I'm a senior educator at um, Turning Point in the Workforce Development Area and I'll be your facilitator for today. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land upon which the presenters and participate, participants are located and we pay our respects to their elders and elders of other Aboriginal communities. Just before we get started, it's just a reminder that this is an interactive webinar. It runs for around about 45 minutes and you'll have some opportunity to ask questions um, you can type questions at any time, but you have an opportunity to ask questions at the very end of the presentation. And you can ask those questions via the chat box, which is at the bottom left of your screen. Uh, you'll also get an opportunity to respond to a couple of online polls that we've put throughout the uh, webinar. And, um, and there's also, a at the very end of the webinar, there's a survey, a very quick survey for you to complete. If you'd like a PDF version of these presentations, um, you'll find those in the box at the bottom right hand of your screen. And if you're having any technical problems, um, just contact Redback on the number on your screen. So it's with great delight um, that uh, that we're facilitating today's webinar, From Clinician to Leader in the AOD Sector, Personal Experiences and Learnings. This webinar draws on the clinical experience and development from clinician to leaders in the AOD sector and is presented by Beth Locke, who's been working in the AOD sector for 11 years, primarily in community health settings. Beth is currently the manager of the AOD service at the Access Health and Community in Melbourne's Inner East. And Beth has a passion for project work, ensuring harm reduction principles and uh, are acknowledged in recovery oriented treatment and supporting staff to feel confident in their work. We also have Shannon Bell, he's the manager of Regen's non-residential rehab catalyst program and he's got over 14 years working in the AOD sector. He's passionate about ensuring that non-residential model continues to expand and be delivered at a high standard across the sector. Both Beth and Shannon are active members of the Change Agent Network and we're very, very pleased to have you here facilitating and presenting today. We do have um, a quick poll. We had some brief discussions in the development of this webinar and just to get a sense of whether you view yourself, um, you know, do you consider yourself a leader regardless of the position that you hold? So you've got an opportunity now to answer yes, no, or not too sure, and you'll get an opportunity to see the responses as well. We're also going to put this um, poll back up later on in the webinar. I think everybody might have responded, so we could close the poll. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Beth. Welcome. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, so firstly, I uh, just want to uh, thank Turning Point for letting Shannon and I come and present today. Um, we've been brought together as two members of the Change Agent Network and to present on our personal experiences of moving from a clinical role into a leadership role. Um, firstly, a little bit about the Change Agent Network. So the purpose of the Change Agent Network has been set up to provide a platform for emerging and established leaders in the AOD sector uh, to build the skills and the attributes of effective leadership. It also develops key networks that facilitate the implementation and adoption of evidence-based practice across Victoria. So the Change Agent Network tries to do that by generating a collaborative culture in drug and alcohol services, which is committed to critical reflection and understands the importance of evidence-based practice. We facilitate the effective translation of evidence into best practice across AOD treatment settings. We lead significant enhancements in clinical standards, workforce practices, client experiences and clinical outcomes in the AOD sector. And finally, we support the succession planning and professional development of the field, um, hence why being invited to present in this forum around leadership in the AOD sector. So firstly, a bit about me. Uh, I've been working in the AOD sector for about 11 years now, as Sandra has already said, and commenced in some shape or form actually when I was still at uni. So I worked in a weekend 
overnight casual support role at a residential rehab during my last year of uni, um, doing a health sciences degree at Deakin University, and I was employed as an assessment and support worker in a community health AOD setting while I was completing my graduate diploma in drug and alcohol studies at Turning Point. So it's a bit full circle that I'm now presenting on behalf of Turning Point. Uh, over the past 11 or 12 years, I've worked primarily in community health, um, in needle syringe programs, as regional mobile drug safety worker for the Eastern region, in intake and assessment and counselling as well, so both um, pre and post reform counselling models. I've worked at Access Health and Community since November 2014 and since September 2016, I've been the manager of the alcohol and drug team there. So while my formal leadership roles have only been in the past three or four years, I've also been taught that leadership is first and foremost an activity, not a role or a position of authority. In a leadership training that I did recently, someone once told me that leaders are born, however luckily we're all born. So leadership isn't just about the people that you manage, it's also about the way that you lead yourself in every interaction and in every conversation. And in this way, clinicians can act as leaders in really varied and interesting ways. There are opportunities to hone and utilise leadership qualities in non-formal leadership or management roles and I encourage everybody listening today to do that. On reflection, I can see that leadership skills or qualities in the role of clinician came out for me in a number of ways. Um, one was around leading by example, or as I like to call it, leading through your values. So I think of an example where I had to have a really difficult conversation with a manager about another colleague's unethical behaviour um, and feeling quite uncomfortable about but knowing that through my values I had to, to make that decision and, and make that conversation. Leading through change or difficulty, um, for me that has always been about providing feedback to management, providing feedback about decisions advocating if necessary, um, but also just checking your mindset and adjusting your attitude to be flexible and responsive to new information and new changes and new processes, particularly ones that have to happen unfortunately. And also just leading in workplace culture. Um, so I love loving where I go to work and I think you know from ensuring that you take lunch breaks to bringing cake to a team meeting to helping orient new staff on where all the good coffee shops are around work. Um, to I started a netball team in a previous workplace, just leading that workplace culture so it is a place that you want to work at and therefore a place that other people want to work at. Now leadership can sometimes progress from within a clinical role to a more formal role or opportunity. And I apologise in advance, I'm going to use leadership and management roles interchangeably. Um, however, I, I mean that in a way where um, there is a more formal sort of management role or leadership role that I'm taking at the moment. So I find that it's best to step into leadership, uh, the best way to step into leadership is just to say yes to opportunities that arise um, or seeking out opportunities that, that, that arise. Um, this might look like, and for me it's looked like, um, being invited to apply for positions both internally and externally um, at other agencies. Even if you don't say yes to the position if it's offered, you know, going for an interview, having some practice around what it is that you want to be doing can be really helpful. Um, taking a lead on a project if something comes up or uh, taking a project to a manager that you're really passionate about, something that might be of interest to you, something that um, you are studying or exploring, taking that to your manager and saying, can I explore this and, and make it work in this workplace. Um, Orienting new staff and students, so trying to teach staff and students what it is that you know, being part of networks, going to um, communities of practice, getting to know people in the sector, um, and finally, you know, stepping up into a short-term leadership or management role. So if you are sort of tapped on the shoulder and asked um, to step up while someone's on leave or um, taking on a secondment, then, then give it a go. Now, nine times out of ten, um, a formal leadership role will probably come from within your own team. Um, certainly that's my, been my experience in the sector and the wider health and community health sector. Um, it's often that you're moving from peer up into a formal leader or manager role. Um, this can be a little bit messy. Um, it can provoke a bit of a sense of grief and loss about um, going from peer and going from peer to leader within your own team. 
However, it can also be really good for succession planning and continuing to build on an already established culture. So it can maintain some stability when a change has occurred. So if a manager has left or is taking some time off, um, you know, having someone come up from within the ranks can actually be quite a stabilising thing for people. Having said that, you know, as I said, it is quite a grief and a, a bit of a loss as well. So I often talk about the fact that I feel like I'm dying a thousand little deaths rather than one big one. Um, you know, I find that to have difficult conversations with people that were my peers in the past, implementing a change that I might not necessarily have enjoyed doing in the past, it can be difficult, um, it can be a loss, but it can be really also helpful to name it, acknowledge it, you know, let the mess be the mess and just work through it. So, leading through, I guess, what you might already know, um, this is where you can start from. So having a real sense of the sector and the workplace can be a real strength. Um, you know, if leaders or managers have come up through the ranks, they can really understand the sector, the issues, the clients, the complexity, the processes, the changes, the history. Um, using clinical skills can be really helpful in a formal leadership or management um, role. So whether that's about building therapeutic alliances with your staff members, whether it's about advocating for change, um, managing up, um, but also some of those micro skills as well when it comes to counselling or working with clients, um, ensuring clear and transparent communication, following through on what you say you're going to do, defining roles and boundaries, um, ensuring everybody knows their purpose within a team, and also to try and avoid splitting or colluding behaviour. So um, trying to let people sort things out themselves and stepping in when needed. Also important to be really trauma informed with staff, so giving choice where possible, empowering choice where possible, um, being more directive as needed, um, and also handing back work to staff, knowing what you can do and knowing what you can't do. Um, you know, in our clinical work we have to often have difficult conversations where choices are um, respectfully challenged and the same is with leadership or management. And I guess the other thing is that ruptures do happen um, both in clinical work and management work. Um, I've found that ruptures with staff can be a lot more obvious. Um, if you have a rupture with a client, often they don't come back, whereas a staff member comes back day after day after day. And um, I think it's important to, again, really name it, acknowledge it, try and work through it, move on, but also just know that you're not going to necessarily make everybody happy with every single decision that you have. Which I guess comes to working with what you don't know. So there is a, a specific set of skills and a specific set of qualities that are required for formal leadership or formal management. And um, I don't mean this to anybody in any way, but just because we're, we're good clinicians doesn't necessarily make us great leaders. And I've certainly had to work through some of that as well. Um, some of the obstacles I guess I've noticed going from clinician to manager have included, you know, feeling the pull from both above and below me. So whether that's around um, upper management or the organisation strategy or the sector or policy reform, whilst feeling pushback within a team that I'm leading and also within myself, um, I find that implementing and selling a change that I'm not necessarily on board with or I'm not necessarily agreeable to is the hardest thing for me to reconcile in formal leadership. Also the, this pull of attention that you get from staff, from stakeholders, from different agendas. Uh, so I have a number of times where people will come into me and, and start the conversation as if I, they know what I'm talking, that I know what I'm ta they're talking about and I certainly don't and I have to just kind of nod and smile and try and catch up eventually. So that can be really difficult and it is a, a different set of skills and a different way of organising your, your mind and your work day. Well, I guess just a few you know, personal experiences to what's worked for me. It's not necessarily going to work with everybody but you know, this is the time where I give you some ideas and some tips. So for me, the best thing that I've been able to do is not blend management with direct service delivery. Now I know that not organisations are going to have that opportunity, um, but I've really found that given this is a really new thing for me to be in a formal leadership or management role, I've had to let go of client work. 
Um, again, that was a bit of a, a grief and a bit of a loss, but I've really tried to reframe it by knowing that I'm kind of working from a macro level of client work now rather than a micro level. So it's no longer how do I make this change for this client. It might be how do I now empower my team to make a change across a community of clients. Um, so that's been a real way to help me to, to come to terms with that. Um, attend some form of formal leadership or formal management training. As I said before, there are many transferable skills, but there's also a range of skills that are required. Um, and if this is something that you are wanting to step into or that you have been asked to step into, it is something that we need to, um, as a sector, um, really skill ourselves up in. So that might be doing some training through Leadership Victoria, um, being part of the Change Agent Network if you are able to be part of the new recruitment. Um, you know, I'm doing a certificate for in human resources at the moment, which is a little bit of a shift, but um, has been really helpful in terms of real micro skills of recruitment, performance management, getting the best out of your teams, industrial relations, I know, I'm sorry, um, or doing a diploma of management, things like that. Ooh. Um, but also doing some more informal reading as well. So reading memoirs, reading articles, people that you know, you know, both inside and outside of the sector who might have um, written about it, their experiences, getting onto that and reading up on it. It's really important to seek feedback from everybody you can. So it might be from within the team, it might be your manager, but I really also encourage people to look outside of their sector or look outside of the workplace as well. Um, it can be really important and really great to have varied experiences and what I have found when I've been able to kind of get feedback from people outside of my workplace or my sector, we get rid of all the content of what's going on and we talk about the context of leadership. So um, looking at that stuff, as I said, that's more transferable. Find your thing and I guess I mean that in a way of if you do have um, an, op an opportunity to step up into leadership, what is that thing in the sector that is grating you? Um, that thing that you've been annoyed about since you started working in the sector, there might be a gap, a flaw, an issue in the system. And how might you as a leader now try to affect that change? So how do you start from your workplace? How do you start from your team, your sphere of influence? Who else needs to be part of the conversation? Who else do you need to bring into that conversation? I guess if you want to think about it, you know, what would you want your legacy to this sector to be? And I guess as a leader, as a leader of the sector, there are some things I'd like to see changed and hope to see changed in my time. Finally, just a, I guess a word about self-care. So what I've really noticed in a formal leadership role is that I've got a lot less boundaries than my clinical work. Um, so we're taught really quickly in our clinical work that um, you know, we uh, to leave our work at work and not think about it at home. Um, you know, we don't check emails, we don't give clients our phone numbers, of course not, all that sort of stuff. Um, but certainly as a manager, I find that I'm much more likely to wake up at two o'clock in the morning because of something that I've got to do tomorrow or something that I did t today, um, including this webinar. Um, you know, that I can find the pull of attention really exhausting. I notice that I'm checking my emails outside of work and sometimes workplaces expect that of you as a manager. But I guess, you know, it's really important to try and pull those boundaries back and know what it is that you can do and know what it is that you can't do. Um, make sure that you're investing in your life outside of work. And I guess the other thing around self-care is really giving yourself time to consider the facts and the opinions that um, people around you have and give yourself time to make decisions. So lots of people want decisions and, and answers right away. An enormous part of self-care is making sure that you give yourself some time, that you just say, can I have a think about that for a couple of days or can I consider that for a few hours? Use your gut, use your intuition. It's really important and it's one of the reasons that um, people are probably in the clinical workplace, um, that we are good at, at listening to our guts. So that's really important in management as well. Um, that's all I have to say. So I'm going to hand it back over to Sandra and happy to take your questions at the end. Thank you very much, Beth. Well done. <laughs> um, lots of wisdom and learnings from your experiences. We've had a, a question as to um, 
there are questions, but what we'll do is we'll hold off from responding to them because I think you might get some of your um, responses uh, from Shannon when he starts. And um, but we can also answer any questions at the very end. We'll save some time for that. So please keep them coming. Um, we'll look at them and refer to them uh, at the very completion of the two presentations. So welcome, Shannon. Thanks, Sandra, and thanks, Beth, as well. Um, we might have a little bit of a crossover in what we'll be talking about today, which is as surprising as we, we had the same brief. Uh, and it was really uh, great to see that a number of people in that poll already identified themselves as a leader. So hopefully where we're pitching today uh, is helpful. Um, but if not, please send through some questions and more than, uh, more than willing to answer what we can at the end. So a little bit about myself. I've been, as Sandra mentioned, in the AOD sector for around 14 years now. Um, and prior to that, I was working in intellectual disability sector, um, developing some behaviour chain programs. And over my professional career, I've, um, because I've been fortunate enough to be in a number of positions where I've needed to develop some leadership skills, uh, with the most recent being the, uh, the manager of the Catalyst programs at Uniting Regen. I have the luxury of, of leading a, a high performing team across um, four separate therapeutic day programs in three um, separate uh, catchments in, in Melbourne metro region. Um, in consideration of today's uh, webinar and in respect to the topic, I think right from the start I'd just like to separate the difference between management and, and leadership because they're not necessarily the same thing. Managers need to plan, they need to coordinate, they need to monitor, make decisions, they need to recruit, uh, they need to organise people. Leadership to me is really about working with people. Working with people to get the job done. Not all managers are good leaders, uh, but it helps if you are. Um, and not all leaders are managers or in places of authority. Um, and that's, that's a really important point to remember. If, it, if nothing else from these webinars, please take that away. You don't need to be in a place or a position of authority to be a good leader. As I continue the conversation, I, I like Beth, I might refer to my, my management position because uh, that's kind of where I, I utilise my, my leadership skills to date. Um, and I might also mention that when I was developing this talk, I kept on hearing a visual arts lecturer I once had saying, you don't call yourself an artist, that's for others to do. You call yourself a painter. And that's kind of the same principle that I have with leadership. Um, what I'll be talking about today, I guess, is uh, my, my understanding and what I envisage um, the qualities and characteristics needed in, in leadership, but really I think I leave it up to those I attempt to lead to uh, assess my, my capability. When I was approached to do this webinar, it, it gave me a really good opportunity to reflect on my own personal journey into leadership and to ask myself, how did I get here? What was it that inspired me to become a leader? And the, first, or the second question felt just out of reach. And I think it was so elusive because I didn't wake up one day and um, decided I wanted to become a leader. It was a combination of life experiences, lessons, teachers, um, that led me to a place of leadership. Throughout my career and life, um, I've had to transition from student New graduate, senior clinician, team leader, manager. Um, outside of work, I'm a, I'm a friend, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a teammate, I'm a neighbour. Um, and all of these life experiences and relationships uh, have somehow contributed to how I see myself and I recognise that leadership has nothing to do with titles but rather how individuals and, and groups work together. And I think where I got to in defining leadership was that leadership's an attempt to influence and foster uh, other people's abilities to achieve a shared purpose. And that's a really important concept related to what I was saying too uh, before. Leadership is about influencing and fostering other people's abilities to achieve a shared purpose. It's got nothing to do with the role that I was in. Uh, it was rather a way of working with people to get the job done. For me, leadership is a combination of skills that, re that require continuous development um, 
and a commitment to self-reflection. Uh, more so, they can be learnt and refined uh, with experience and attention. And I'll definitely be the first to admit that I don't always get it right. Um, but it's probably where I've learnt the most when I haven't got it right. I think that's one of the demands of, of leadership, um, taking responsibility for my actions uh, and those that I'm responsible for, um, and understanding the impact of those actions on others. So I also mentioned self-reflection is an important part of leadership. Um, understanding ourselves. Um, to do this, and I might, to do this I had to ask myself a, a question, and I, I might ask you to do the same. Um, who, who was the best, or who were the best leaders that you've ever worked with? What was it about them that you respected, that you admired, that you found helpful? And who were the worst? For me, I can think of a number of people that I like to I guess, model how I lead um, or how I don't lead uh, in my current role. And a number of those have definitely influenced how I, how I work. Personally, I like to be proactive. I like to be organised. Uh, I like to lead from example. I have a real interest in the professional development of my staff. Um, it at times can require patience um, and an ability to recognise the strengths and, and weaknesses of those that I work with and how to utilise those characteristics to benefit their strong points and limitations um, to ensure that we're, we're working towards something. I derive great satisfaction in seeing my staff develop their leadership skills and move into positions where they're able to utilise those skills and excel. Uh, and if I could provide some suggestions around... Sorry, I've missed a couple of slides. If I could provide some uh, suggestions that might help people foster their leadership skills, um, I would say work within a team, a team that has a shared purpose, shared clients, um, and also has opportunities to, to act in uh, higher duties. Find ways that you need to, to act in uh, higher duties. Find ways that you can supervise um, some staff. This might not necessarily be uh, in a clinical supervision role, but you can always take on coaching roles. You know. Engage in conversations where you support um, a colleague of yours or a staff member to gain a better understanding of the clients. Um, be the first to put up your hand and take the initiative. And if you say you're going to do something, definitely do it. Um, be the first to listen and they'll ask to speak in meetings. Ask for people's input. Um, and if you don't necessarily agree with what's being said, be inquisitive rather than discarding. And very importantly, uh, view professional development as a lifelong journey and it continually gets built on. I strongly value uh, ensuring that my staff also take calculated risks, um, but also letting them know that I'm there to support them. You know, things don't go well. Um, that I'm, I'm there to, to provide that fallback. To give you an example, um, I can think about a staff member I once worked with who uh, was very confident, very intelligent, um, wanted to be seen as capable, like, like we often do, um, but had little experience in, in running some of the therapeutic groups that we deliver in the Catalyst programs. Um, and they were putting their hand up. They wanted to run one of these groups, and they're not easy. Uh, at times. Um, not only are you working with the individual, you're also working with the group and the dynamic of the group, and you never know what's going to come up. Um, this one guy, he, he had the education, he had the, um, the theory, but not necessarily the experience. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, the experience is important. Um, is he ready? I'm not too sure. Uh, but we decided to, to give it a go and to, to cut a long story short, he ran the group, it was challenging, um, but he learned a lot in that one hour, more so than he would have done if he had to observe the next five. It's a calculated risk, allowing opportunity to make mistakes, allowing opportunity for the staff to be vulnerable without retrimand. Um, this fosters trust, safety and lays the foundation from which people can learn. For me, it's also really important that I make myself available to my staff. Um, and when I do, that I'm present and I'm in the moment. Um, 
this has become becoming more and more challenging as my role gets busier, um, the demands escalate. Uh, however, it's something that I still hold really high on my um, leadership hierarchy uh, and I've put significant effort into ensuring that I've got the open door or that I am available. Um, and this is probably a really good example of the trade-off and opportunity costs in regards to management and leadership. There are leadership actions in which I value uh, and I have them very high, but as I, as my role changes, the demands of the role changes, um, I might not have the same attention that I might have been able to or that I would have liked to. Um, at the core though, I still try to be approachable. Um, even at, the busy, at my busyness, uh, I, I try to be authentic, uh, professional, optimistic, um, and caring, supportive. Um, and I've had to become very good at, at delegating as well, um, which is quite hard at the start. The time being a, a scarcity, it's about allowing to let go um, and sharing the task and you come to a recognition where you can't do it all yourself. Leadership can be a highly rewarding experience. There can be times where there's real comradeship, uh, a shared purpose, uh, an achievement, uh, responsibility, recognition uh, of the work that goes in. However, the flip side of that is that leadership can also be really stressful. Um, it can be lonely um, and also really challenging. The reality is when, when working with people, there's going to be friction, there's going to be confusion and there's going to be performance issues. Um, and it's, it's pretty much your job to, to work your way through that and to manage it the best of your ability. There's been some important learnings for me when managing and leading through performance issues. I've come to recognise that underperformance and performance issues happen. That's not to say that you're not going to have high quality performance, I'm not going to say you're not going to have unity or clarity, but that's not really what causes distress and stress. I like to think that the performance issues fall into two separate categories. Um, hammers and pins. So hammers are often those incidents that are quite easy to identify, that, um, that once you manage them, they often don't occur again. Pins, on the other hand, are those small occurrences that happen over time repetitively. Um, and if you don't manage them, can have a really big impact on, on the staff and clients and, and other people who are involved. And this is leadership. It's doing, doing and recognising that you won't always make everyone happy. It's having those courageous conversations. Um, it's about recognising that if you don't manage it, things can, can go wrong. It's through these times that managing through, through challenges and difficulty that I think I've tried to phrase it as um, it's the times that I've learnt the most and there have been uh, opportunities for learning. However, I've also come to recognise that there's only so many opportunities of learning that I need if other people don't change their ways. Although this has been an area of leadership that can be challenged, I also believe that this is the area that our clinical skills um, have, that have been honed, um, help in regards to managing the emotional vulnerability that we might be managing with our staff. And it can be done with respect and integrity. Um, grief, loss, shame, helplessness, hopelessness, these are all uncomfortable emotions at the best of times, let alone in the workplace. It's my experience as a clinician working with clients that um, when there is a client who shares or, express, or expresses vulnerability, uh, it allows a place for intimacy and authenticity. And that's kind of where the work happens. And it's true in the workplace. Those staff that do express those amount, emotional states, it allows an opportunity to look forward and to see how I or the organisation can support them through. As I've indicated, leadership and management can be stressful and demanding. Ensuring good self-care practices are essential. And I'll admit this is another area that I don't always get right. Uh, and I've come to recognise that there isn't really work-life balance, there's just life balance. Um, 
There are times when I'm at home thinking of work and there's other times when I'm at work and I'm thinking at home of home. Um, and in fact, some of the best thinking that I do comes from my thinking space, which is my shower. Um, the trick is to recognise when life is becoming unbalanced uh, and to understand if it's situational or if it's more of a, a, a pervasive a pattern um, that will impact your health if, if not addressed. For me, the like bed for 3 a.m. wake up is a pretty good indicator and a rumination that follows that things are challenging at the moment and that I need to do something for my self-care. Uh, there are a number of things that help me. Um, sorry. There are a number of things that help me. Uh, things that I, I think I, I have a pretty good understanding of the roots of my stability. Those things that keep me grounded, such as I jog at, at lunchtime when possible, or I cook, or I garden, or I paint. Um, these activities enable me to have a bit of a creative outlet, but also a mindfulness process as well. I, I prioritise family and friends. Um, and I'm also fortunate at uh, different times in my life to have two great mentors to guide me through my professional and private life. Uh, the work that we do in Catalyst also has a cognitive behavioural approach. Um, I utilise this and I live it. Um, so it's not only what I practice, uh, it's you know, when I am preaching it as well. And I think most importantly to develop a practice of self-compassion. Um, be kind to yourself, celebrate your strengths and recognise and act on those areas that need development. And lastly, learn to let go. In finishing, I'll come back to the reflection of how I got into leadership. And I think it was an organic evolution that occurred over time that incorporated a conscious awareness of others and a deep understanding of myself. It involved learning different approaches of effective communication and, and also learning what motivates people. Uh, for me, a good leader, like a good clinician, um, has a genuine interest in people and understands that the job doesn't come first, that people come first. And without a, a thriving, cared for team, the work suffers, people become dissatisfied, the organisation suffers, and ultimately the clients suffer as well. And if I was to think about my journey into leadership positions, such as my current management role, I can clearly remember standing at the crossroads uh, and making a decision which path will I walk down the client work or the management. I think it's important to understand that there is an opportunity cost for walking down the path of management. And that's having less time to do the clinical work on the front line. But rather, the work that I do now uh, is an attempt to support and foster those that are responsible for doing the front line engagement work. For me, there have been times where it's felt right to step into leadership roles and other times where I've really had to challenge myself and push myself out of the comfort zone, out of my comfort zone. Um, and for those that, that might be contemplating an opportunity to move into leadership positions, I'll leave you with something that one of my, my mentors asked me to reflect on. And that's, if not you, who? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. That was um, very, very, very reflective, and um, I can hear um, what it takes, and the work it takes, and the concentration, and the courage it takes to take on leadership roles. We've had. Um, I'll just scroll down. We have an opportunity for you now to uh, have another go at the poll. For those of you who might have come in late, we had a poll earlier. If you'd like to launch the poll, thank you. Um, just asking, do you consider yourself a leader? And we just wanted to get a sense of whether anybody, after hearing Beth and Shannon's um, presentations, to get a sense of whether you think you might fit um, or be thinking about or already doing that maybe you hadn't been before. So we've got people respond. Oh, everyone's responded. Well done. Some people not sure. No. <laughs> everyone's pretty sure they're leaders. That's good to hear. Thank you. I think we can close the poll. We've had a few um, questions and comments, and it was really nice to see that um, there was a comment from our online audience that was suggesting that everything, that all the questions they had, 
Beth, in fact, had responded to, so had preempted, so had no questions. Which was, so it's it's a good sign of a leader who's preempted all the potential questions. We have got to have another question around. Um, I'll just refer to. We could scroll down. Um, what type of supervision, and maybe I can ask this of you, Beth, what kind of supervision do you think leaders need and is this different to clinical supervision? Uh, good question. Thank you, Peter F, for asking it. <laughs> um, I think for me, you know, I've got sort of a line management supervision. Fortunately for me, she's also from a clinical background, so that's really helpful and I guess I would consider her to be a mentor in the sector. Um, so that can be really helpful. I also find that sometimes we're just too similar and we agree too much on, on how we're doing together, um, that it is really important to get some extra and external kind of feedback and supervision, um, whether that's, as I said, kind of within the organisation. I work in a community health service, so I can quite easily find managers or leaders who are not um, necessarily drug and alcohol related or are not in my line of um, reporting, so that can be really helpful. But as I said, even going outside of that, um, getting kind of rid of the, the content of, you know, the drug and alcohol stuff um, and moving towards actually the context of how you managed a situation or how um, you might be struggling with a certain situation. So um, I've got another manager at the service that I find really helpful to go have a coffee with and bounce ideas off and um, certainly know that she works in a really different way. So she's a much more sort of pragmatic and um, a no BS kind of um, person, um, but outside of the workplace as well can be really helpful. I uh, hope that's answered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got another inquiry here about do you have any models of leadership training that you might recommend or refer people to who might be looking at um, exploring this a bit further? So maybe Shannon, if you'd like yeah. to answer that. Yeah. Um, as part of, of CAN, we've been fortunate enough to um, receive some training from Leadership Victoria, um, which has, um, I guess, provided a, a different perspective on what leadership actually is. And, and some of the, the conversation that I was speaking about today, particularly around um, leading from positions that aren't in authority, that, that came from um, some of the work that both Beth and I had been introduced to from uh, leadership Victoria. Um, and then it, you know, I guess the other aspects is you know, depending on what your interest is. Um, I'm currently going back to university to, to look at um, some of the, the management um, education and within that there's leadership as well. Um, so it's about finding out what your interest is and, and really exploring what's out there. Um, but I would definitely recommend um, Leadership Victoria. Thank you. And just I think we'll just have one more question and this one uh, is asking about was there a moment when you knew that you were ready for leadership and if so was it related to feeling accomplished in your clinical role? So who would like to answer that one? Maybe Beth would you like to have a go? Yeah I'll have a, I'll have a crack. Um, I don't think there was a moment. I think for me, um, so I was sort of employed in a senior clinician role um, first before sort of a management role and really got to the point in my workplace that I was in at, the, at that time where I had felt that I had kind of gotten all the juice from, from the lemon. Um, so I had been there for eight years, didn't, didn't leave on bad terms or because I was unhappy, just really felt that it had come to a point where I was feeling ready to, to fly without wanting to be too um, sentimental about it. Uh, in terms of it being uh, related to the accomplishment of my clinical work, I, I don't think so. Um, I, you know, that sort of internal critic still thinks that I'm terrible at both, so that that's hard to, to sit with. But um, you know, I think, as I said, certainly the clinical work can really feed into it. And um, on on the opportunities that I do get to see clients, you know, whether that's someone's called in sick and then there's an assessment at nine o'clock or something, I still really enjoy that, and I. Um, find that, um, as I said, kind of continuing to grieve about that. Um, but it certainly didn't kind of go, well, I, I've done everything I can in clinical work, therefore I'm going to go into management. Um, if anything, it, it, the clinical work kind of feeds that management role. 
And very, very quickly, maybe if I ask you to respond to it too, please, Shannon, just very briefly, what was that moment when you knew? I think there's, uh, I can think of two occasions. Um, one where I felt ready, um, and it was a matter of, of, uh, I guess, reflecting on, on where I was in regards of my, my own professional development. And that question, if not you, then who? There's probably one more question uh, or addition to that is if it's not you, are you going to be happy with the person that you <laughs> in that role? Um, and to ask yourself that is really important. So in, in the occasion I'm thinking about, I felt like I was capable um, and ready. Um, there, there has also been in other times where I haven't felt confident about it. And um, it's a matter of, again, looking at, I guess, that inner critic that Beth's also talking about there and challenging some of the beliefs of what we are capable and not capable for. Um, and I guess challenging yourself. Um, sometimes you're never right and ready, um, and that's sometimes the best time to move on as well into a leadership position, um, because that's often where the most growth happens. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you both. Um, I think that was a really courageous um, exploration of your experiences as leaders and um, thank you very much for making yourselves available in your incredibly busy um, work environments and work roles and I hope that um, it certainly inspired me thinking about what it takes to be a leader and it doesn't mean having to be a manager which I think that, that's a, a real good understanding. Um, so thank you very much. I'd like to just alert you to our next webinar and this will be on smoking cessation during AOD treatment and titled Are We Doing Enough? And it will be presented by Turning Points Dr Victoria Manning and that will be on the 18th of April at 1 o'clock and you will be able to register soon at Eventbrite, usual locations. Thank you very much. Um, really enjoyed uh, everyone's co contributions out there. And thank you again to our presenters.